Tov. Today's daf Yomi is Nidarim daf Ayin Nidarim 70. And, but we're going to start on Samach Tesema Beis, three lines from the bottom, as we continue with this incredible chapter of Nara Hamurasa. So the Gemara says on the bottom of Samach Tesema Beis, that Rabbi asks the following question. We've been discussing the laws of annulling a vow, and so we will review these laws, just the basic laws, that even though in general, if a person makes a vow, a person has the ability to go to a chacham or a bezdin of hediotos, to go to a scholar or a court of regular people and have them annul the vow, either through a Pesach, they find a way to annul the vow, that situation you didn't know, or Harata, you were angry when you made the vow, you have regret. Even though that that is the case, nevertheless, there's another way a vow can be annulled, and that is by a husband on the day he hears the vow. He can be made fear the vow. Or a father of a minor girl, on the day he hears his daughter make a vow, he can be made for the vow. But the father can only do this until his daughter is either an adult or she's fully married. And the husband can only do this by himself once he's fully married. When they are in this state, when the, when the girl is in a state of being betrothed, while well, she's still not yet an adult, she's not a Bulgarian, she's not a full adult, when she's betrothed to her husband, then the Mishnah told us that the father and the husband can both annul the vow together. They both need to annul the vow together. That annulling the vow is called Mayfair. We're rejecting the vow. But there's another aspect in that the vow can also be upheld. And if instead of rejecting the vow, the father or the husband is Mekayim the vow, they uphold the vow, then they're no longer able to annul the vow because they were, they were Mekayim the vow. So now Rabbi asks the following question. If a, if a, if the father or the husband says in general to his daughter, I am upholding your vow today. The implication of that is that your vow is upheld today, but not tomorrow. Tomorrow it's rejected. So the Gemara asks the question. Me, Amrina, and since that was the way he formulated his, his statement about the vow, do we say, since he says, I'm upholding your vow today, it's as though he said to her, your vow is rejected tomorrow. Because he said, since I'm upholding it today, it's like he said, your vow is rejected tomorrow. Or maybe we don't say, let's look at the implication of what he said, the inference of what he said, but rather look at what he actually said. And he never actually rejected the vow for tomorrow. So that's the question Rabbi asks. So let's say he says, I'm upholding your vow today. What is, the, what is the meaning? What is the import of that statement? Is it as though he's rejected it for tomorrow? And so therefore the vow is rejected. Or, or since he didn't fully formulate that, it's not going to be rejected. And then the Gemara on Ardaf, on Ayin Amad Al says, Im Tim Salom or Halo Amrla. But let's say you say, okay, in the end, he didn't actually say, I'm rejecting your vow tomorrow. He didn't actually say that in the end. So if that's the case, Amr wa mufar l'chi l'machar maho. Let's say he did actually explicitly state it. He said, your vow is rejected tomorrow. He said, I'm rejecting your vow tomorrow. One of the laws of rejecting a vow is it has to be done on the day that he that the father or the husband hears it. So let's say on the day that he hears it, he says, your vow is rejected tomorrow. Do what we say, me, I'm reading Lamachar Lamatsi Mayfer. Do we say, well, that's too late? Tomorrow he can no longer reject the vow. Because he has, because since he upheld the vow today. Therefore, tomorrow, he can no longer reject a vow. Or perhaps we say, or perhaps we say, or perhaps we say, since he did not actually say, I'm upholding your vow today, 
Mufar Machar Mayom Kamar. When he said to her, I'm rejecting your vow tomorrow, it's as though he actually said that it was rejected from today. So that's the question that Rabbah asks. The imp is meaning to say when he says you're rejecting it, I'm rejecting it from tomorrow, it's as though he actually started the rejection today. And I can read the language of the Mefarish. The Mefarish explains as follows. If he says your vow is rejected tomorrow, what's the law? Because in effect, is he upholding the vow for today? Because since he's saying your vow is rejected tomorrow, it proves that on the day that he actually hears it, have a neder. So he didn't make a vow, and he has upheld it. And now he's no longer able to reject it. Or perhaps we say, says the Mefarish, or maybe maybe since he didn't actually say, hold on, I'm losing a bit. Since he did not actually say, I'm upholding it for you today. And so therefore, it's as though it is rejected. So back to the Gemara. And if you want to say, Or if you want to say that since he has or if you want to say that since he has upheld it for her today, then, then therefore we're going to say, hold on one second, that the next day, Lamachar command Isa Dami. It's as though he was upheld and therefore he can no longer reject the vow. If you want to say, it's as though the vow has been upheld and so therefore he can no longer reject it. Because as the Ron explains, once he says it is rejected for you tomorrow, it's as though he has upheld it for today. And since it was upheld for today, it's as though the vow was upheld. And so therefore, since tomorrow is not a day of hafar, it's not a day of rejection, the vow is upheld. Let's say we have the following situation. Me, I'm Rinan. And by the way, we say the Ramam holds. And every time we say it, if you want to say it, it's as though that is the regnant position, that is the ruling position. And therefore, we have to be ruled strictly in those cases. So therefore, we have the following case now. Me, I'm Rinan. So if that's the case, let's say he upheld the vow for one hour, meaning to say he didn't uphold it for today, so, meaning to, but he upheld it just for one hour. Do we say, since he said either your vow will be rejected after one hour, so therefore, so therefore it is as though it's as though he's rejecting it after one hour. Or maybe he didn't actually say that. So look at the round here. He says, I'm going to uphold your vow for one hour. So here, the low dummy shav achar shav, because upholding it for one hour and then rejecting it for one hour is not the same case as upholding it for today and then rejecting it for tomorrow. Because this whole day is a day in which he could actually reject the vow. And so therefore, if he upholds it for one day, for one hour, it's different than if he upholds it for one day. If he upholds it for one day, then maybe he can no longer reject it. But if he upholds it for one hour, then indeed, he could still reject it after one hour. So maybe it's still going to be rejected. Oh, so that's the question that the Gemara just says. That Kim Let's say upheld it. He said, I'm upholding your vow for one hour. Do we say Kiman the Amarla Mufer It's as though he's saying, I'm rejecting your vow after one hour. Well, Dilma Halo Amarla. Or maybe that's not what he actually said. And so therefore, for this reason, the vow is going to be 
upheld. And now the Gemara says another possibility. If you want to say, well, he, na- he actually never rejected the vow. Hello, Amrullah. He never rejected it after one hour. So therefore, so Mia, what about the following scenario? What about the following scenario? If, so Amrullah, let's say he said, I'm upholding your vow for one hour. And then after one hour, it's going to be rejected. So there he is explicit that after one hour, the vow is rejected. Do we say, my Amrina, my, do we say, me Amrina, kivin the kimo kimo, once he has upheld a vow, the vow is upheld. O kilm, o dilma, kivin the kua yoma, bara kamo, bara farahu, or do we say that since the whole day is a day where you could uphold the vow and a day where you could reject the vow, ki amr mufiru chila achar sham ahani, if he says that your vow is upheld, after one hour, your vow is rejected. After one hour, it's rejected. Meaning to say, what do we say that once he does that akama, even though it was just a temporary akama, it's as though he's, it's completely upheld? Or do we say, no, he just did the hakama for one hour and then he did the rejection for, and then he did the rejection. And so therefore, it's considered like the father or the husband rejected the vow. So the Gemara says, Tashma, let's try and bring a proof from from the Mishnah in Nazir, which is our next tractate. <laughs> we're discussing, we're in the Seder of Nashim, the volume dealing with women's issues. And Nazir, which is a riddle, is in tractate Nashim. But we do know that a woman can become a Nazir. A Nazira, it's an explicit verse in the Torah. So here we know that the, that the Mishnah says, if a, if a woman says, Hareni Nizira, the woman says, Behold, I am a Nazirite. Vishama Bawa, and her husband heard about this. Va'amar, when the husband hears her making the vow to be a Nazirite, he says, Va'ani, and also I, ain Yahoah Fair. Then that is going to be considered like he upheld a vow, and then he's no longer able to reject this vow. Va'amai, and the Gemara asked the question, Why is he no longer able to reject it? Name of Va'ani da Amar, who al Nafsheh. So the Gemara says, why is this case where he hears her saying in Nazarite and then he says, and also I, why is he no longer able to reject it? Why don't we say when he says, and also I, he's talking about himself, the al nafsheh he's saying about himself, the Havi Nazir, that he is a Nazarite. But when she says, Hareini Nazira, but when she said, behold, I'm a Nazarite, that's just referring to herself, that she, she just, up, and, and so therefore she's saying about herself that she's a Nazarite. So maybe th- that, so maybe what's going on is he's upholding her vow for one hour, and then after that one hour, he's rejecting it. If he wants, he can reject it. Why can't he reject it? Lav Mishum, isn't this a proof to keep in the Kaimo? Kaimo, isn't this a proof that once he upholds her vow, even for a temporary moment, then he, uh, he's no longer able to reject it? Isn't this therefore a proof that once the vow is upheld, even temporarily, it can no longer be rejected? The Gemara says, no, that's not the proof. Well, Kasavar, no, the Gemara's assumption is that the Mishnah is saying that whenever he says, I'm upholding it, it's not, you, it's not a temporary upholding. His baseline was that he's upholding it forever. So it's as though he said, Emani, and also I, it's as though he's upholding her vow to be a Nazarite forever. And so that's why, and that's why at that point, uh, we're going to say he can no longer reject it because he upheld her vow forever. Now we go up to the bottom mission on the bottom of Ayin Amad Aleph and the bottom of 78 that the Mishnah tells us, Mesa of, that if the father dies, so he said that the husband and the father, when, they're both, when she's betrothed, the husband and the father both have the right to have the requirement to together annul her vow. But let's say the father dies, so she makes the vow, and now the father dies. While they're betrothed, the authority does not pass over to the husband to annul the vow, and the husband will not be able to annul the whole vow because he could only do it in partnership. 
So once the father dies, the authority does not transfer to the husband. But when the husband dies, the authority of the husband does transfer to the father and the father will be able to annul the vow on his own. In this sense, the father's husband, the, the father's authority is greater than the husband's authority. Because the father can annul the vow by himself under this scenario while she's just betrothed, whereas the husband would not be able to annul the vow himself in this scenario while they are just betrothed. But in another scenario, the father, the husband's authority is greater than the authority of the father. How so? That the father, that the husband can annul the vow while the girl, when the girl is in a, a full adult, when she's married to him, the husband still has the right to annul the vow. But once she's an adult, the father has lost that right to annul the vow. He can only annul the vow while she's a nara, while she is from age, basically, a nara is from 12 to 12 and a half. And also she can make the vow while she's still a katana from 11 to 12. But once she's above 12 and a half, even if she's never been married, the father has lost the right to annul the vow. So the Gemara's first question is, my taima, what is the reason that we say that, that the, the authority does not go from the father to the husband? Like it goes from the husband to the father. Well, what's the reason? So the Gemara explains, that the verse says that they can know the vows while she is in Na'ara, well, she's in her state between 12 and 12 and a half while she is in, while she is in the house of her father. And this implies, said that, says the Ran, that even though her father would, might no longer be alive, so she's still considered to be in the house of her father. And so therefore, the husband will not be able to fully annul the vow. But when the husband dies, the domain, the authority passes to the father. May Sabal, that when the husband dies, in Sorokna Roshus Ba'av, the authority does pass to the father. So the Gemara says, Minolan, the Gemara says, what's our source for this? About here we have, again, these gears issues. Amar Rava, the, some say Rava, some say Rava. The Amar Kra, it's based upon the verse, Vimayosiela ish undarela. It says, if she will be betrothed and her vows will be upon her. That is the verse. And prior to this, the Ran reminds us that prior to this, it says that the father can reject the vows. And then it says if she gets married, then the husband can reject the vows. So what does that mean? It says, it says right prior to this, it says if the father annuls the vow. And then it says, if she will be betrothed and her vows are upon her, which means that there are two types of betrothals that the father has the right to annul the vows. Makish says the Gemara on the top of 70b. So we compare prior to the first betrothal to prior to the second betrothal to prior to the first betrothal, meaning to say just like that. So just like what is prior to the second betrothal, meaning after her fiance dies and her betrothed dies and she's able to become betrothed to another person. So just like before she's engaged in the first place, her father can annul her vows. So too after she's engaged and her betrothed has died, then the father can annul her vow. And that's the, what the Gemara says. Just like prior to the initial betrothal, the father can annul the vow on his own. So too prior to the second betrothal, meaning to say after the first husband or after the first betrothed has passed away, av me ferochude. The father can annul the vow on his own. And so therefore, and so therefore that's the point that after the fiance, after the betrothed dies, the father can annul the vows on his own. So the Gemara says, but Ema, but but maybe that's a totally different story. Maybe when we say that the father can annul the vows before the second betrothal. Maybe that's those only refer to vows that were made 
after the first betrothed dies. But if she had made a vow when she was betrothed to the first man, maybe the father doesn't have the right to annul those vows. Maybe that only refers to vows that were not that were not able to be betrothed. But by vows that were able to be betrothed, or Matsi Mayfer, maybe the father is not able to annul those vows. So the Gemara explains, no, even the Dharm Shon Nero Laros, if there were vows that were not made basically while she was still betrothed, if there were vows that are not made while she was still betrothed, me binura beisavianaf. We would have learned that out from generally speaking. While she is a nara in her father's home, we would learn that she's able to annul it. So therefore, therefore, if we have a special teaching to tell us that she can betroth it before the second one, it mean it must mean that that's referring to the vows that were made while she was still betrothed to the first person, and that even after he dies, the father has the right to annul those vows on its own. So now we go back to our mission. Our, our mission has said with this, the power of the father is greater than the power of the husband. And that is that the authority after the husband dies transfers completely to the father. Whereas from when the father dies, the authority does not transfer to the husband. But there's another area where the authority of the husband is greater than the authority of the father, that the husband can annul the vows when she's a complete adult, whereas the father cannot. So the Gemara says, hey, when we say, when that which we said that the uh, betrothed can annul the vows when she's full, uh, fully an adult, whereas the father cannot. What's the scenario? What, what's the scenario where we allow the husband to annul the vows while she's a full adult? What's the scenario? If you want to say maybe in a circumstance where he betrothed her while she is a nara between the twelve age of 12 and 12 and a half, ubagra, and then she became an adult, if that's what we want to say we're referring to, mihti misa motsia. Well, we don't need the, we don't need that to be taught. Why? Since we want to say, since death takes her out of her father's home, ubagras motsia mirishus af, and also becoming an adult takes her out of her father's home. Ma misa wo nisrauk ne rishus labal, af bagras wo nisrauk ne rishus labal. It can't be that the scenario we're talking about is where she was fully, where she was betrothed. And then while she's still betrothed, the, she becomes an adult. It can't be that that's a scenario where we allow the husband to annul her vows. Because if her father would die at that point, the husband wouldn't have the full right to annul her vows. So the Gemara assumes that Kalva Homer, how much more so, if she just becomes an adult at that point, that wouldn't allow her to have the full authority that wouldn't allow him to have the full authority to annul her vows. So Ella must be Shekit Shekishi Bogaris. It must be, we're talking about a scenario where the husband betrothed her while she was already an adult. And at that point, the father doesn't have the right to annul her vows anymore because the father only has the right to annul her vows when he's able to betroth her, which is as a minor or an ara. And so therefore it must be that he betrothed her while she's still an adult. And so therefore, that we're saying that he has the full right to, annul, the husband has the full right to annul her vows at that point. So the Gemara says, but that, it wouldn't need to teach us that. We already learned that. We, we haven't learned it yet, but there's an explicit Mishnah that tells us that on 73b. This Mishnah tells us, if there was a girl who was betrothed and she's fully married, she's over 12 and a half, she's a full adult, and she was betrothed, and she was betrothed for 12 months, then under that scenario, that at that point, Rabbi Eliezer says, since her husband is obligated to support her, he's able to annul on her own uh, her vows. So therefore, so that's what Rabbi Eliezer says. So we see at that point, so we see at that point that that if he betrothed her after she was an adult, that he's able to betroth, he's able to uh, annul her vows all the way on her own. Because once she's been married for 12 months, he can, uh, he, Rabbi Lezer says, since he's, the husband is obligated to support her, he can annul her vows on her own. So the Gemara says, wait, first we have, a, before we get to answering the, the proof from there, let's just deal with an internal contradiction in this Mishnah, Gufa Kasha, the Mishnah is itself difficult. Um, 
Amris HaBulgeris HaShas HaShnei Masar Chodesh. He says the Bulgaris, who, who, an adult girl who was waiting 12 months after she was betrothed, then the husband can annul her vows by himself. But Bulgaris, why do we say after 12 months? Because that's when he has to support her already fully. Bulgaris, Bulgaris, an adult girl, she, after 30 days, the husband is required to support her. So the Gemara explains, no, Tani, no, the Mishnah there is teaching us uh, two principles. It's teaching us Bogaris, a girl who's an adult, the husband has to, has to support her after 30 days of betrothal. And also a regular girl, a regular girl who was engaged for 12 months, the husband has to support her. But anyway, we see from here the basic point, the Gemara says we see from here the basic difficulty that, that a, a girl who's an adult has to be supported has to be supported after 30 days. And we see from there that the husband can annul her vows fully without the father. So we, so we already know this principle that if she was betrothed after she became an adult, the husband can annul her vows. So why would we need our Mishnah to teach us this? So the Gemara says, okay, fine. The reason why it says it twice in two different teachings, you can say, okay, the main print, the main idea that a girl who's an adult can be, uh, can be the main idea that a girl, good morning, the main idea that a girl who's an adult is supported and that a girl is an adult, her husband annuls her vow. That main idea is basically uh, taught in our mission, that when she's an adult, the husband has a full right. If they became betrothed after she was an adult, the husband has a full right. That basic mission is here, is taught here. So why is it repeated on 73B? Because there, there's a dispute between Rabbi Lezer and the Rabbanan. That Rabbi Lezer says, specifically there, the, the fiance, the betrothed, has the right to annul the vow on her own. But the Chamim said, even after the 30 days or after the 12, day, 12 months, the, the husband still doesn't have the right to annul it until he fully marries her. So that's the reason why he repeats it there to tell us this dispute between Rabbi Eliezer and the Rabbanan. Or alternatively, Yibayis Ema, Bogaris Dafka, that, that the mission on 73b is the real case. That's the real source for it. But, but why does it say it here also if the Mishnah there on 73b says it? Because I did the Nasev Reisha Bazeh, Nasev Seifu Nami Bazeh, because the because we are talking about in the first clause of our Mishnah that this is where the father has more authority than the husband, so too we're going to say also we need a case to show that the husband has more authority than the husband. And so therefore it lists it in both cases. But really the main source is over there and that's why the Mishnah says it twice. And we'll stop here. Everyone should have a very meaningful and powerful uh, fast of redemption.